So, um, for my dissertation, and after that, I have been working in Yasuni, dealing with basically wildlife conservation and focusing on the effects of oil extraction uh, in this region. Uh, well, because it's our main issue here, no? So in the readings that you had to do uh, for today, you, have be, you saw the importance of oil in Western Amazon, no? So we will talk about that first we I will talk about uh, briefly about uh, the biodiversity in Western Amazon, the importance of oil uh, for the region, and then we will talk about this study case in Yasuni, talking about uh, wildlife conservation there, and uh, ending up with uh, the Yasuni ETT initiatives, you read about a, a bit of that also. And then uh, put up there the questions for discussions that, that you could use to follow up with this talk. Um, so, Western Amazon is really uh, important for conservation because it's huge biodiversity. You read the paper of market bus and collaborators and then uh, you had the opportunity to get familiar, familiarized with it right so uh, talking about vertebrates we have a huge number of animals uh, about 600 species of birds uh, 130 species of amphibians about 200 species of mammals just in a uh, yasuni area no. <clears throat> Why is this area so biodiverse is a good question, uh, probably because it's a combination of the Andean foothills that provide a lot of nutrients uh, and different uh, microclimatic conditions given the topography that is not really so flat like in eastern Amazon, but more hilly here. And high precipitation, high temperatures, so a lot of uh, conditions that are favorable, favorable for uh, life, no? for biodiversity. So this area is rich in biodiversity, but also in oil. And uh, for the whole region, oil is a really uh, important resource. Uh, so the countries that are within Western Amazon are Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia mainly, no? And for all of them, uh, oil is important. Uh, it accounts for 46% and 51% of Colombia and Ecuador exportations, no? And for example, in the case of Ecuador, all provided that 22% of the government budget in 2014 and well now that the oil price has uh, dropped uh, it accounts about 10 percent uh, for the government budget so still a very important resource for uh, the different developments of our countries uh, and yeah uh, we cannot see much of this development because a lot of this money is lost, lost, uh, lost in, in corruption. No? Uh, our politicians, our governmental system is really corrupt. And uh, so we see a, a lot of waste uh, in these resources. No? For one side, we are building a lot of infrastructure like big roads that are connecting different points. Uh, of the country, right? But yeah, this infrastructure also is costing two, three times more than what they really should cost. So uh, it's an example of uh, the impact of corruption, corruption in this waste of resources. And if we go uh, through a timeline of uh, resource uh, of different exportations uh, per country, in Western Amazon, we can see how 
important oil is or mineral products, no? So here is a uh, trend of exportations for Ecuador since 1993 to uh, 2013. And we see that oil uh, is really important and has been growing since uh, earlier times, no? Uh, and as I said earlier, it accounts about 50% of exportations for Ecuador. Uh, in the case of Colombia, uh, it also is a very important resource, about 46%, plus also Colombia exports a lot of uh, coal and another, another mineral products, so mining uh, is also important, no? hydrocarbons. And in Peru, it's a re uh, also important. Uh, oil per se is uh, not as big as for Ecuador, but uh, exportations are divided uh, between hydrocarbons and uh, minerals. So mining there is a more important issue than oil, although, although oil is growing also, not the oil industry is grow growing in, in Peru as well. And in Bolivia, the case is very similar to Peru. No? Mining is now more important than oil, gas in that case, in that country. Um, okay, so from a geographical perspective, you can see here uh, how uh, oil activities are dominating uh, Western Amazon here in this map, in this pinkish polygons. You can see. Uh, different uh, stages of oil extraction. No? Uh, here, these uh, polling ones with these lines are uh, areas that are potential for oil extraction. No? This clear pink is the areas that are uh, being uh, requested uh, for oil extraction or explored already and exploited these purple ones, no? So it's all over the region, no? All over Western Amazon. Um, and yeah, uh, this area, Western Amazon and Amazon in general is rich in resources such as oil, but also uh, it has an important cultural diversity, right? More than uh, 350 indigenous groups live here. Uh, here's a map where you have indigenous uh, territories in this kind of orange color and unprotected areas. No? So uh, people really is uh, dominating this landscape since historic times. So it's not an empty landscape. No? It's not a human vacate that is occupied. And they have been part of this landscape. No? So uh, the case of oil extraction in uh, Yasuni and how uh, um, it is affecting uh, biodiversity. So where is Yasuni? Yasuni is in Ecuador's Amazon region. Uh, it's an area of about uh, seven, actually 8,000 uh, square kilometers. 7,000 was before. and. Uh, Sorry, 8,000 uh, square kilometers is the uh, Waurani territory, and the park is about 10,000 uh, square kilometers. No, uh, so Yasuni National Park is this green area, and the Waurani territory is this yellowish area. But the whole area has been already occupied by indigenous groups, especially the Waurani. No. As I said earlier, it's a very diverse area. For example, in a single 25 hectare plot that has been monitored since mid 90s, there's over 1,100 uh, trees and shrubs, no? And so this is a huge biodiversity at a global uh, level. Uh, this site is always competing uh, with a site in Malaysia that is doing the uh, same surveys of uh, vegetation. No? So it's one of the uh, 
richest areas in the world in terms of biodiversity. Terry Erwin, a famous entomologist, says that there may be about 100,000 species of insects per hectare in Yasuni. You know, this sounds kind of ridiculous, but it, uh, it shows the importance of uh, these areas are uh, hotspot, no? Yeah. Well, other species that are not so steady are fish, no? Uh, about 400 species, at least, none of, of fish there. Uh, but as I say, few people, a couple of people are really uh, studying fish in, in Yasuni and the Amazon in general, no? It's an understudied group as insects. Uh, well, and amphibians, mammals, birds are also important. You can find very charismatic species such as harp eagle <coughs> or uh, this little bush dog, no? A canid that commonly people don't know exist in this area. People in the city in Ecuador don't know we have a wild dog species in our Amazon area. And it's, this is one of the two dog species that we can find there. So the Warani, the historical inhabitants of this region, uh, is a very rich culture. Uh, they are regarded as a semi-nomadic group, no? So their culture was based on hunting and gathering forest products. Uh, they would move. Uh, they will uh, form uh, these uh, uh, settlements uh, that would occupy for a few years and then move around once a gang was depleted in an area or, or once they had a conflict with another group, you know. And, <clears throat> and these pictures are, um, are a common theme in, in this Guarani life, you no? Know? Uh, as I say, uh, they are hunters, you no? Know? Uh, men uh, are strong hunters, so uh, commonly you will see that they go for hunting in the mornings, and uh, they come back in the afternoon, about midday or a bit later, they put the game they procured on fire, and they spend a lot of uh, leisure time not talking and chatting with their family and singing and doing their, their stuff, what they want to do, no? Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's very nice to talk with them. When, when uh, you talk to them, they say, well, Rani are free, no? We are free people and we like freedom. Um, anyone can do whatever they want, something like that, no? Yeah. It's, it's their culture. So they do everything they want, no? Uh, they are very skillful, no? So not just hunters, but they do a lot of handicrafts. Handicrafts. Uh, <clears throat> this girl, for example, is showing a, a fiber of a palm species uh, called chambira, and they do a lot of uh, uh, different handicrafts with this, no? And palm trees are used a lot by by these people. Uh, here, for example, you see this guy building this house uh, no so they use one uh, species for the roof another species for uh, these little walls no so <clears throat> they depend a lot of, on, on these uh, resources for their survival no so uh, the history of oil extraction in Yasuni starts in early 40s when first oil companies come to the region, uh, in this case was Texaco and Shell, uh, they come here, uh, engineers come and start explorations in this Guarani territory. But there's a lot of conflicts. Uh, Guarani are recognized to be very aggressive yeah, in, and defensive of their territory. So a lot of accidents, confrontations happen there. And Oil companies retreat. And then in early 50s, uh, groups of missionaries, especially one group, the Summer Institute, uh, Instituto Linguistico de Verano, some Linguistic Summer Institute, something like that. I, I can 
I don't remember that name in English exactly. Uh, well, they come and uh, contact the Warani, you know, they start uh, dropping presents from uh, little airplanes or helicopters, you know, they drop these goods to them and then uh, they make contact uh, with these groups. It's not easy for missionaries to contact uh, Waurani. Uh, there's there are some accidents, fatal accidents, with some missionaries that are attacked by the Waurani. No, but they persist persist in their effort and finally uh, make their uh, evangelization activities and relocate. Uh, many, most of the Waurani are relocated from. Uh, Two uh, permanent settlements in one small area of the uh, Warani territory. And then in the early 70s, uh, after Warani moved to this uh, small area around missionaries, uh, all companies come back and start all exploration in vacated areas. No, uh, in 79, the National Park is created, and in 80s, early 80s, the first, first road for oil extraction is constructed. And well, um, oil extraction is associated uh, with road development, no? Uh, we need roads to conduct these activities. It's not possible, almost not possible to access resources without roads. So. I studied the cascade effects of road development on a, this a, on a wildlife in this ecosystem. No, a, so first I wanted to see. Uh, I mean, this um, not first I want to see. Sorry, this is a, a graphic of that represents what I wanted to understand. No, so road development uh, provides access to the landscape, landscape and to markets and uh, how this can be affecting uh, the use of wildlife by people that could reduce a uh, game and then end up reducing the top predator of this ecosystem jaguar you no know? so this could be uh, this would be my hypothesis of of my study you know so since road started in yasuni people uh, switches switched from a uh, 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 subsistence hunting activity to um, commercial hunting activity. They change it, they replace it, uh, blow guns and spears with shotguns. No, they became more effective hunters. And here you see uh, Warani coming out to these markets of Saya Sunni to trade bushmeat. No, uh, you read a little bit about that too. That was a common scene when I was. Uh, studying uh, in this side uh, when I was doing my dissertation. Now they continue trading, but the government has enforced control over trade that is illegal. And so now all the activity is uh, out of our side, no, it's illegal and we don't see, but they still uh, trafficking uh, wildlife for bushmeat uh, principally. And so I work with these people uh, doing a surveys of uh, their hunting activities. They were in charge of uh, surveying uh, their own communities, no? And it ended up to be very effective, no? And they collected information about the species, their weight, the reproductive status, the place where they hunted, and they were very good at it. So in a more or less one year study of, of hunting, we, we observed that uh, very few people, about 170 people, extracted 3,000 animals, which equals uh, 53,000 uh, kilograms of uh, bush meat. No? An impressive amount of this biomass came from peccaries. Uh, we have two species of peccaries, colored peccaries, and wildly peccaries in this area, no? And 35% uh, of this uh, biomass uh, was sold in markets. 75% of that 
that traded biomass came from pecaries. So you see the importance of pecaries, no? For these people. But pecaries are also important for jaguars, no? It's the main prey, prey for jaguars in this region. So uh, how this access to the landscape and to markets affect the use of wildlife by people? Well, first, they, they hunt more, no? This is, um, this bar represents total harvest in settlements close to markets and far from markets. And we see that there's a significantly uh, higher uh, per capita harvest of bushmeat, no? And also those who live close to markets uh, trade more bushmeat than those who live far away from markets, not simply because it's easier to access markets for those who live close. Those who live close in Yasuni to markets need, uh, need about three hour travel to go, uh, to go to markets and come back. Those who live far away need about eight, 10 hours to get to the market and go back to their home. So you can imagine. Uh, and uh, another uh, important uh, change uh, in wildlife use is the proportion of uh, individuals that are harvested per species uh, you know, by hunters. So uh, I don't see here, I cannot see uh, this bar uh, of the, I mean, this bar is kind of hidden by uh, we can see it here, Santiago. You can see it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, what we see here is that some species that are valuable for markets, like wildlife uh, pecaries, color pecaries, pacas, uh, are more exploited or more harvested proportionally by hunters who live uh, close to markets. However, other species that are very valuable for Waurani culture, such as monkeys, for example, or birds uh, are not uh, hunted in higher proportion for those who live close to market, but uh, are more used for those who live far away from markets. For example, a woolly monkey or a spix one that is here, no? Those species uh, are appreciated by, by, by Warani but they provide a, a few biomass, so it's not profitable to hunt them and trade, no? The, the ones that are used to markets, uh, they prefer to harvest something big so they can have a bigger revenue from trading bushmeat, no? So this differential use of species may be uh, causing changes in the community of wildlife in these different areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, about the roads, how do they affect uh, this use? No? Besides uh, facilitating access to markets, uh, uh, they also increase uh, the harvest area of people. No? So what I did is comparing a hypothetical harvest area accessible uh, by Waurani if they wouldn't have uh, roads. That will be about a eight kilometer ruddy from settlements, no? It's more or less what uh, hunters can move when roads are not accessible. And those is represented here uh, in figure A, right? These uh, circles uh, around triangles that are settlements that were studied. But uh, then, uh, if you plot all the uh, hunting, hunted animals, these little crosses in figure A, you know, and do some analysis, you will see uh, that uh, a lot of the biomass that is extracted is uh, associated with vicinity to roads and settlements. You know, and the probability here in figure C, the probability of hunting in a place is very much related to uh, the distance to roads and rivers that also become more used when uh, you have access to roads because now you can purchase 
gas to use a dug out canoes with engines, no? So it's a synergistic effect this, uh, that is caused by roads uh, that are developed for oil extraction, no? Uh, on hunting, no? So roads and oil extraction uh, create a strong synergy to, uh, that goes against the uh, wildlife populations. Yeah. <clears throat> the other part of my study was looking at different uh, sites uh, with different degrees of accessibility and uh, surveying the wildlife community there. No? So, uh, prey and jowers, right? And here are uh, sites that I studied, these were four sites, no? Two of them uh, were quite close to roads. One was on the road, on the Maxus Road, other was close to the Auca Road, and two of them were farther away uh, from roads. This is a new road that started to be building and now it's about here, no? What I saw is the probability of finding a prey species such as peccaries, for example, this is the widely peccary, uh, dropped significantly in the areas that were uh, closer to roads or on roads. So, for example, wildlife pe peccary uh, had a probability below a 10% to be observed in an area such as Queweriono, uh, one of the areas close to the roads, and, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, <laughs> close to the Maxus Road, and was not found in, in Queweriono, no? However, in Tiputini, one of the most remote sites, and, Lo, uh, and Lorocachi, this species was very occurring, no? It was easy to observe, observe it. Same thing uh, happened with other species, such as the South in Curacao. This is like a little turkey of the forest that is very appreciated by people there. Yeah, it's very good, very tasty, but has a slow reproduction rate. So you can see how the probability of occurrence of these species is much lower in these accessible sites than in those sites that are farther away. Other species such as uh, agoutis, for example, that are harvested mainly near homes and uh, have higher reproductive rates are not affected by these effects of accessibility and road development from our extraction. And how this affected then the abundance of this uh, large predator? Uh, well, we observed that uh, the density of jaguars increased uh, with uh, remoteness of areas, no? So here, these three different bars represent different methods to estimate a density of this large cat, no? And uh, you, you, uh, these bars are ordered from uh, higher access to low access to hunters, no? So in the most accessible side on the Maxus Road, uh, the density of jaguars was about 0.8 to 1.5 jaguars per 100 square kilometers, while in the most uh, remote area, this density was between 4 and 5.5 jaguars per 100 square kilometers. So this is a huge difference in terms of density and can tell you how uh, negative is the effect of, of road development and oil extraction for conservation of this animal, no? to put this in numbers, Yasuni National Park with uh, 10,000 uh, square kilometers, if all the park would have a, a density of Java similar to this one, no? to a remote area that is not uh, accessible by roads, just the park itself could preserve a minimum viable population of Jaguars. No? However, if density is similar to that on Maxus Road, uh, we wouldn't be able to preserve a viable population of jaguars in the entire bioreserve of Yasuni. So Yasuni, Yasuni National Pla uh, Park plus the Waran territory wouldn't be enough to have a viable population of jaguars. No? 
So uh, we are studying these effects of wildlife uh, uh, of, of oil and on wildlife, yeah, but uh, and many people understand how negative is oil extraction uh, for uh, conservation, uh, and that was the reason why uh, in uh, 2007 uh, this ITT initiative was proposed by the Ecuadorian government. No, so you read about it. Uh, the idea was to keep 900 million barrels underground, that's the volume of oil under uh, Yasuni. And uh, uh, in exchange, they requested uh, about 350 million per year for 13 years, which will, from the international community. And this money would represent about 50% of the revenues that uh, Ecuador would get. If it's oil was extracted. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this initiative was launched at the same time with a plan B uh, that was extracting oil from Yasuni if the international community or wouldn't uh, provide these uh, resources. No? Uh, so uh, it was always um, initiative that was uh, blurred with this plan B, no? And both plan A, the ITT initiative, and plan B work simultaneously, no? So at the time the initiative was launched, <clears throat> other group started to look for potential uh, <clears throat> exploitation of Yasuni, for potential uh, companies that will be interested in exploiting this oil, you know? And well, uh, <clears throat> the efforts to raise money for Yasuni and, and this, uh, to lift this uh, initiative to make it successful continued, continued until 2013, you know? When uh, it, this initiative was definitely discarded, no? And uh, then the government concentrated exclusively on Plan B, extracting oil in Yasuni. But uh, already in 2012, uh, a new road started to be built inside the uh, Yasuni National Park, a few kilometers down the river from uh, San Francisco Station uh, University, uh, uh, the Putini Biodiversity Station, a place where Betty works for a long time. You know? So now we have a new road of 20 kilometers that is going into Yasumi down there to extract oil reserves. No? And yeah, there was a lot of civil unrest, a lot of protests for the society. Uh, a group uh, of young activists was formed called Yasunidos. Uh, indigenous people also protested against this oil exploitation, but the government paid not much attention. Actually, it became more a uh, controller of, uh, of the activities of these environmental groups, uh, and they even uh, closed uh, different uh, NGOs that were working uh, towards this initiative. For example, Pachamama was a foundation, uh, an NGO that uh, worked uh, with this ITT initiative and was closed in uh, December 2013. No other environmental organizations were also closed no? because they opposed uh, the government idea of exploiting oil in, in Yasuni. No? So, uh, <clears throat> With this, uh, sorry, I took more time that, than allowed. Uh, I can drop some uh, questions that you can think about. No? First, uh, how academia can contribute to future conservation of this natural uh, landscape? No? Basically, uh, in terms of research, what is our priority research to uh, inform management of this area? No? 
Uh, in this, we can think about different scales, approaches, you know, that we can use uh, <clears throat> for our research and to inform uh, management decisions. Uh, another question, how can we reconcile humans with nature, no? Uh, for example, uh, think about development and conservation, uh, think about natural versus novel ecosystems, no? Uh, are we doomed to, uh, are we, uh, or natural ecosystems are doomed or what, you know? Uh, however, also thinking the importance of fossil fuels uh, and other resources for our uh, society, right? Uh, we saw how important these resources are and then we can uh, see how strong drivers of change these resources are. Now, how challenging is conservation in countries that depend so heavily in these uh, resources? And finally, why do you, do you think Yasuni ITT initiative failed, no? Uh, for those who are interested in economy, for example, what other plan Bs we could have, no? So we could uh, discuss this uh, later on. So uh, thank you very much. I don't know if you have uh, more questions or...